can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so today, um, I was going to do this talk with Peter Ebden, my boss, but um, he decided that he needs to go on the vacation, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm doing this myself, and uh, I prepared everything myself as well. Um, so today, um, our, um, the subject would be um, data pipeline with monorepo and Kubernetes. Um, are any of you data engineers around here? Um, does anybody do anything with deployments? Okay, um, so anyone actually are doing anything with monorepo or Kubernetes? Nice. I guess it's not going to be so um, disfamiliar for some people then this time. Um, so first, um, let me introduce myself. So um, I work as a software engineer at Thought Machine. Um, infrastructure team. Um, mostly I'm dealing with build systems and deployments or developer tools or CI CD and uh, I previously worked as a um, data engineer um, mostly working on ETL and uh, data pipelines on AWS. Um, but um, at that time I didn't really do much about like automa automated deployments and uh, everything is kind of manual actually. Um, so here is um, what happened. Um, so we had, like, I work in a specific data team, so it's called Data Labs. And uh, so we have a se separate stream of deployment um, from the main applications, including stuff like um, our front end or our API. Everything was, like, quite separate. And uh, the main issue there was, like, the deployments. and. Uh, so basically sometimes would be like all the things runs on my machine, but we never, or on the, even on the development environment, but when we um, promote it to production, it just fails. Like we didn't know why. And uh, so a lot of times we're, um, we spend a lot of time actually trying to figure out why. And then most of the times it's because of some kind of dependency issues or compatibility issues or just some little configuration errors that we made and uh, but still like um, it was quite time consuming and uh, all of a sudden one of our clients requested um, okay we don't want the data pipeline our data to be on AWS because we signed a contract with um, this and that cloud provider so um, we were like okay now what do we do everything we have is on AWS and so basically we had to kind of redo <laughs> everything um, from scratch, and so like um, I didn't really know anything about monorepo um, until um, I think mid this year. Um, I think there are some. So does anybody actually know what it is? Okay, anybody use it? Okay, so um, basically it's the idea of kind of having all your project in one repository. I know it kind of sounds kind of crazy, right? Like, um, because especially nowadays, modern technologies would be focusing on microservices and then you would be thinking like, um, if I have everything on one repository, do I have to kind of clone everything onto every single instance or VM of mine or every single Docker container? Actually, the answer is no. And uh, it's being actually being used by these companies, and then so they are, the misconception is um, like you have to get clone everything, and but that's not actually the case. And uh, um, so like, um, but the thing is like you don't have to actually deploy the code at all, and then so you only need to deploy artifacts that, for example, binaries, and uh, so you actually don't check in your code. You build the specific parts of your repository and deploy it onto um, containers or VMs. And uh, so the advantage of monorepo is um, you don't really need to define what projects are anymore. You just kind of make specific tools for specific things and then you can decide that later on. And uh, um, also it's um, really good scalability and and like some of the stuff, for example, we have like specific tools, like common tools. You can just import it from other 
um, for any other projects, and you can only even just use like one file. And uh, for example, if you want something for um, let's say AWS, but some other applications are on GCP, you can just use like specific, just one file for like AWS and build that um, build that artifacts and deploy it onto um, your any type of thing you want. And it's really easy to refactor as well since it's only in like one repository. And uh, so with monorepo, like I mentioned that you deploy artifacts, so you will need to use a build system. Anyone actually used anything with build systems? What do you use? <laughs> well, I guess you would call it Bazel, but... Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, um, so yeah, Bazel is actually an open source um, version of Blaze, and I'll talk about that later, actually. Um, so how do they actually work? Um, if you have never heard of it, I'll explain it step by step, so um, everybody knows how everything, how a build system actually works. Um, so basically, it's like given a um, Git repository contains a lot of source code. In our case, it would be like a monorepo and uh, the build system would just like um, following specific instructions build the um, convert those source code into artifacts it could be anything like um, executable or binaries just anything you can just run with a command and or start up a service or um, anything like that and uh, so I mean as Matt mentioned before it follows specific instructions so we would need a build file and uh, it's kind of like a series of high level rules. Like most of the times it's just like a function that you call, for example, Python binary, Python test, and uh, the build rules convert the source, the sources um, into the outputs, which are usually our artifacts. Some, like they're always, um, they're executable, except for libraries or um, other things, maybe tests. Um, and uh, that's an example of the um, a build file. So you can see that um, um, they're they're actually um, the, the it's taking the source and uh, also like it take, takes the dependencies and the dependencies are another thing that's called a build target. So it points to specific directory structure and a specific build label as well. And so basically the be benefits of the build system is um, so we can actually know what kind of third parties libraries we have. So like the kind of dependency issues that I mentioned earlier would be easily resolved. And uh, we don't have to worry about like incompatibility between the development environment and production environment. And especially when the clients ask, okay, what kind of third party dependencies did you use for this application? I need to know everything. So to, for security reasons, and uh, we usually, we can usually provide them that with just like our build files for third party libraries. And also you can use, since everything is like built, since all the built outputs are um, binary, so you can in actually have different languages in your repository. Actually, we do that at Thought Machine. And uh, so you don't have to, and also obviously you don't need to clone everything into your um, containers. And it also checks license and as well. So here is the kind of history of build systems or like choices of build systems. Someone mentioned Blaze early, or Bazel earlier. Um, it's like an open source version of Blaze, and but it's not actually that similar to Blaze. And for Facebook um, and Twitter, they have their own um, open source build systems as well, and then they are quite similar. And uh, um, but I think each of them have different things to do with their specific system as well. And uh, we have actually our own build system called Please. And so basically you can run commands like please build with actually PLZ. It's quite funny, the first time when I saw it, I actually didn't think it was real. <laughs> and uh, um, so it's quite fast um, for Python, for building Python binaries, 
um, and C, bin C++ binaries, it's actually faster than anyone, any other build systems. On the, it's written in Go, and so we can do quite a lot of um, and concurrent processes. And uh, obviously, I'm one of the main contributors to this build system as well. And so now we have our artifacts built by the build systems. We need to worry about um, deployments. Um, let me introduce you to Docker. And I think some of you raised your hands when I asked about Docker containers, right? OK. Um, so for those of you who have, who have not used them, basically think of it as a box or a container. It kind of packages up your um, code, source code, or your configuration and stuff. Um, but in our case, it's just our artifacts and some configuration or like environment variables. Um, it can run anywhere and on any cloud. Um, usually we use Docker file as, um, to build images or run containers. Um, so we don't have to worry about the configurations or don't have to rem remember any kind of configuration details anymore. Um, so that's the difference between the container and VM. As you can see, it's kind of different, and uh, um, VMs are actually running on, like, kind of running different um, systems on a single machine, and then Docker containers. You don't actually need to that base OS anymore, and it's quite, it's a lot cheaper to run Docker containers that way as well. So that's an example of a Docker file. Basically, you, it just install everything you want into a container, and uh, you run, you copy specific uh, specific um, binaries or artifacts from your local machine to the um, the container, and it's basically kind of like a virtual file system, I guess. Um, and then you run the command, and when it starts up, um, it kind of just a specific service just starts up right away, and. Uh, with Docker containers, especially with microservices, we would have need a way to manage everything. So we usually use Kubernetes to um, manage containers. Any of you use Kubernetes? I think I've asked before. Awesome. Um, so um, it's like the reason why we use it is because we can just easily um, have Kubernetes to worry about how actually everything kind of is deployed and then all we do need is just to create a um, specific control, what we call is controllers and to control each and individual containers. And we don't, actually we don't even need to worry about containers anymore. And so this is like an architecture of how Kubernetes, a Kubernetes cluster is like. We have a master and, uh, and some, and a, um, a bunch of minions and they're called nodes and uh, inside of nodes, there are different pods, and inside of the pods, it's containers. But usually, we don't need to worry about the containers anymore. It's like a bit on a two level, two lower level side for Kubernetes. You don't most of the times, you don't even need to worry about most of the stuff on this anymore. Just the structure. So there are a few concepts. Um, so. With pods, so it's like I mentioned before, it's like a smallest deployable units. Think of it kind of like VMs, um, but you don't actually need to worry too much about it um, in terms of individual pods because we usually manage them with a controller, which, which we'll, I'll get into that later on. Um, so all the containers actually share the same kind of namespace and uh, CPU or memory inside of the pod, and uh, usually it's like disposable. If any of you used um, EC2 instances, that's like mm -hmm. usually disposable and ephemeral, and uh, pods are kind of like that too. And then, then we have services, and so services are kind of like, um, it selects um, specific pods um, based on their key value pair, like their labels, and uh, that's what you, we usually call um, microservices. And uh, so we can have a lot of services running at the same time. And this is usually used for like service discovery or like um, um, load balancing because you can have um, duplicated 
kind of pods or services as well. And next one is um, deployments. That's actually something we do need to worry about. Um, so it's like I mentioned before, it's a type of contro um, controller that manages po pods and uh, replica sets. And then you just need to tell it how many, what kind of images you need, what image you need um, to create these containers, and how many pods do you need, and uh, how should they roll out, and then the resources, and everything else as well. And then this is kind of like an example of um, what a deployment um, file, configuration file for deployment looks like. And uh, that's about it. And also with please, you can um, actually use um, pleasings, and then that's like there's some <coughs> rules for Kubernetes um, and Docker containers. And uh, let me actually show you. Um, yeah. So. Um, Basically, most of the times you need to refer to specific images and then as their full name, but right in here you can just use the build, specific build targets to specific um, Docker images and it would build it, your, build it by itself. So yeah, that's about it. Oh, any questions? So any questions? Um, Can you grab the, the microphone just off of anyone sitting next to you and push the button to talk? Um, so Kubernetes is, as far as I understand, is very good for non-parallel code. You have a container and you run that container. It does its job and then it shuts down if you want it to shut down. Uh, can you use it for parallel jobs or for big data requirements? If I have a large data set and I want to do the number crunching, where Spark might be really good for, can Docker and Kubernetes do similar things? Um, I think you could, but it, because like um, Kubernetes can scale horizontally, I think you just need to assign like how many of the pods you need, and then it does. It, I think you could do like parallel processing on them too, and then you can also like do different. Okay, parts as well, so. Can I, can I just uh, say that? Uh, uh, I'm doing exactly add, that add to the, uh, the mic, please. Sorry. Press the button. Um, I'm, there we go. I'm doing exactly that parallel processing at the moment. It's possible. You just have to do a bit of managing on your, on your yeah. data and everything else. Is, you're, you're just scaling horizontally. Yeah. You have a service and a task. You know, that's, that's kind of the key thing. You have to scale horizontally yes. your workers, and you have a task node that finishes when it's done with the data. Yep. Um, yeah. <coughs> you might want to mention also that you can pool different resources for different services. Yes. So if you've got you know, machines for different, different requirements, you can put them into the mix. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you use some kind of orchestrator like Airflow or something with uh, with this? And how does the deployment interact with that if you use some kind of orchestrator? I'm sorry? <laughs> what do you use to control uh, the tasks to create, for example, to batch the the, the, the runs and et cetera? Um, we usually create um, specific scripts to kind of run specific um, deployments. And uh, usually we use that as a, um, in, inside of, and we create our own commands for those scripts as well. So usually um, at my place, we just create specific things, kind of like create our product, and then everything kind of spawns up inside of Minikube, like locally anyways. Uh, uh, my question was more like, if you have to run the same task every day, mm -hmm. So for doing data wrangling from one place to the other, uh, how are you controlling that and the dependencies and stuff? Oh, um, we do run this kind of jobs. Usually it's in Jenkins. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> oh, you, yeah, you go first. Where did I get the microphone from? Oh. Oh, thank you very much. 
Uh, am I correct thinking that you are using uh, EKS on AWS? I'm sorry? You are Uh, you are using EKS on AWS, correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, with, with my experience of AWS, ECS is better. It works out cheaper and has better integration. For example, I am Rose. Okay. So wh wh why did you go with EKS if it's AWS? Um, it has been like our kind of set up for quite a while, so we didn't really change it after a while. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, my understanding of containers when you put them into clusters like that is because you're going to be dropping them, building them, and kind of load balancing them across different things, it's best for them to be completely stateless. Mm -hmm. So, when you're working between different uh, environments, you know, between your staging and your production environment, surely the underlying state store, whatever it is, uh, is relatively different between the two. So how do you make sure that, you know, as you're going from sort of dummy fake staging data, wherever that sits and working and testing things, that suddenly when you put it to production with actual people's data and then you have to do schema change, stuff like that, how, how does the deployment system deal with that sort of thing? Um, what we usually do is we usually create like kind of dummy data if we know like um, what we can get, because usually we get the data from API and uh, we have like, sorry. <laughs> Um, we have we would know how the data might look like, so we create a small set of um, dummy data, kind of just mirror that kind of environment. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? There's a question over there. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, just a question about the mono repos. Um, so you say you're only checking in the artifacts, but surely you do still want to check your code in, not for deployment, but just for development purposes. So how does that work? Do you have two separate repos then? Um, I'm sorry, the microphone was a bit quiet. Oh, it's not good. Um, with the mono repos, mm -hmm. so you said you, you're only checking in the binaries and the artifacts and not the code. Yes. But surely for development purposes, you still want to check your code into a repo somewhere. Yes. So we how does that work? Um, yes, on our local machine anyways, I think um, because our repository is small enough to be, be checked into one machine and uh, so we still build specific part, um, we still check in the whole thing, but from what I'm understanding, since like with Google anyways, they have like massive repositories, so they only have like um, small amount of the parts of the repository that you work on and build it and test it. When I was wondering, uh, in, your, in your build setup, um, did, did you say that you use uh, Minikube when you build locally? Yes. And so do you, do you support distributed builds with Please as well? And how, how would they be orchestrated? I'm sorry? Do you support distributed builds with Please? Um, I think usually with that, we usually use like our own made like um, kind of the bash file, um, bash scripts to do that, yeah. But usually, like with deployments, you can kind of do somewhat like that. But I'd say usually we usually do like specific scripts specifically for um, kind of distributed jobs. Yeah. Should we take one more question? Yeah. Hey, uh, with the mono repo, how do you or, or do you, I guess, do you do any sort of checks or balances to check that you don't end up with like cyclic dependencies between different? Packages or different areas of the repository. I'm sorry. I think the uh, microphone is really that how quiet. Do we, uh, Are you pressing the button? It's gone really quiet. Yeah, which is probably bad. Uh, how, how do you avoid cyclic dependencies in your mono repo? What dependencies? I'm sorry. Cyclic, cyclic. dependencies. Um, actually, I don't know. I'm, I tell you that later. I check it out. Fair enough. Uh, let's thank Luna.